I will send rain upon the earth. You know the attitude of some people. God said he will do it. Let him do it. God said he wants to send rain now. We've had three and a half years of drought and of famine. And God, I didn't, uh, you know, twist his arm. I didn't tell him to say this. He said that himself. And it was of his own volition. He said that. He said, I'm sending rain upon the earth. And some people feel that you don't need any preparation, any prayer, anything to do. Since God has said, he's going to send the rain. But look at verse 21. In verse 21, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But he bear then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You see that? He came to the people and he said, You need to stand. Take a stand and say, Where are you? Are you on the Lord's side or are you on the side of Baal? But God has said he's going to send rain. And why did Elijah have to do that? Because we need to prepare. This is a preparation for the coming of the latter rain. And if God is showing you that he wants to use you, and he wants to do something great in your life, and through you to other people, we need to prepare. I pray God will help us to prepare. I will not just take it for granted. God said he will do it at his own time. He will do it, yes. When you prepare yourself, we're looking at it from the starting now. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. That's part of the preparation. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. The Lord has said, He'll send rain. So, Elijah, why do you have to do all this? Because there's the preparation that precedes the outpouring of that latter rain. And then it says in verse 31, And Elijah took 12 stones. Why 12? Why not 13? I said, why not 13? Why 12? Why not 11? 12 tribes of Israel. He wanted all the 12 tribes of Israel to be represented. Because he wanted the spirit of God upon the whole nation. The revival upon the whole nation and the rain to cover the whole land and the rain was not just going to fall in a few tribes it was to fall in the 12 tribes therefore he were told that he took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of jacob unto whom the word of the lord came saying israel shall be thy name and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench round about the altar. As great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order. And he put the wood how? There's orderliness. And we do everything decently and in order. As we're preparing that you know, the Spirit of God will come. Whatever is wrong in the heart and whatever needs to be pre properly placed, we do that. And then it says uh, over there, it says, fill four barrels with water and pour it upon the sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And he said, and he did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And he did it the third time. Four barrels of water once, twice, three times, four times three. What's that? Twelve. Why? Twelve times of Israel. Do you see that these people in Bible, this didn't just do things haphazardly. They had reasons for doing them. And when you have biblical reason for doing something, the Lord will bless what you do. 
and the water ran round about the altar and he filled the trench also with water and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said Lord God of Abraham Isaac and of Israel let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these how at thy word that's the preparation when you prepare yourself for the coming of the latter rain and for the outpouring of the spirit of God you do all things according to his word at his word hear me O Lord hear me that these people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again and the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. Let's look at verse 42. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Camel and cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up and look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, What? There is nothing. But God gave the promise. I'm sending rain upon the earth. Back in verse 1. And now he began to pray. And he said, my servant, go and see. He looked and he saw nothing. You know, some people, they just take everything for granted. God has said he will do it. If God has said he will do it, why pray? Why fast? Why wait upon the Lord? Why have prolonged time of praying? That's the attitude of some people. But that attitude is not right. And as you look at our church, well, let's think about our church now. I mean, deeper life in particular. We are preaching, but we don't have praying. We are preaching, we have doctrine. And we spend, we can spend like one hour in preaching. I spend more. I spend generally like one hour, 15 minutes, or one and a half hours. When it comes to the time to pray, five minutes were through. Hey, they didn't do that in Bible days. If they did that in Bible days, the miracles who have seen here will not see. And the exploits they did will never be able to see something like that. And that's the reason why if you really have a good intention, a good heart, and you want revival in the house of God, in this church, and what God wants to do, that he wants to take the message from here and take it across the globe, we have to be praying people. This attitude must change. You know, if, if nobody says it, if I don't say it, nobody else will say it. Most people just say, you know, accept whatever it is we are doing in the church. And even when we see that, you know, there are people there, whenever we are praying, I said it uh, last night, either they are waving their hands or they are, you know, making sign that, Pastor, that's enough, that's enough. We need to go to the next program. It's not the next program. It is what has God done with that false program that we're rounding up. And sometimes you have people like that, and sometimes you feel this almost a waste of time. Because if we cannot pray, whatever we preach, we don't have the grace to carry out. We don't have the strength to carry out. And the power is not in us. And whatever it is we're hearing, we've had something like this before. What is now lacking is the prayer, is the waiting upon the Lord. And if we finish the preaching and then we cannot pray, it's useless. And then think about it, brothers and sisters, in a normal church, a Bible-believing church, it is the person on the pulpit that ought to be under the authority of the Holy Spirit to control the trend of the meeting. How long the meeting lasts, how long the prayer lasts, how long everything we do lasts in that particular meeting. When the control is in the hands of members of the church, when the control is in the hands of somebody who doesn't love praying, in who wants to control the time you pray and how you pray and what you pray for, that's not orderly, that's not scriptural. And in such a case, if the preachers yield to that, that's like the head becoming the tail. That's like the leader becoming the follower. That's like the leader becoming so intimidated and frightened and fearful that he says, hey, 
These people are going to chew you up and they are going to do quite a lot of things. So better just round up everything and go your way. And then we cannot listen to the Holy Spirit. But here we listen to the Holy Spirit. And you know what? If you cannot pray here, you are not praying at home. And if uh, praying for five minutes or ten minutes kind of inconveniences you that you already receive your hand and waving your hand, pastor, stop, pastor, stop, pastor, stop. It means that the temperature of the church spiritually will be the temperature of the prayerless people in the church. Because it's those prayerless people that do not like to pray or do not know how to pray. They're the people that want you to stop everything right now. Stop it right now. And our preachers, I think our preachers are yielding to that already. You already recognize what the signals they give and the things they do. But uh, by the grace of God, if I'm in a place, I'm there. If I don't want to come, I don't want to come. If I'm there, I'm there. And whatever the signal, we can stand that fire and that heat. And, but we don't need to walk against one another. I'll take the time I will take. If whatever we do and whatever we don't do, I'll still take the time I will take. You must have noticed that since yesterday. And so why try? Why do that? And then God is not in support of that. Am I right? Give me a good yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know my name now. I'm William. William means the defender of the faith. And whatever it is, we stand for, we stand for that thing. And we'll keep on standing in Jesus' name. Let's cooperate together. Don't hinder Elijah. If we're going to raise up other Elishas, it's going to take some real praying. And it's going to take some real preparation. And all we're saying is, let God be God. And let us just stay in our places. And uh, our members and workers, we're not supposed to control the pastor. The pastor is supposed to control the church, control us. I think uh, that's the right thing. Is that right? Are we going to do it like that? Then we're going to have real fellowship and love. And the outpouring of the Spirit will be upon us in Jesus' name. And so we will see what Elijah did. He prayed. And he, he, did what, he did what the Lord directed him to do. And then he says, the fire came. Look at that verse 38 again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. And then when he came to the time to pray for the rain, he prayed and said, go and see. And there was nothing. And then he, we're, told, he, we're told in verse 44, and it came to pass at the seventh time. That he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. There'll be a great rain. There will be a great outpouring in Jesus' name. The question is, what's the purpose of the latter rain? Point number three, the purpose of the latter rain. Deuteronomy chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 14. The purpose of the latter rain. Why does God want to give us the latter rain? Why is he giving us the promise of the latter rain? And why are we making preparation for the latter rain? We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 14. That I will give you the rain of your land in its due season. The first rain and the latter rain. That, that means so that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. It's for fruitfulness in ministry. That's the reason why he's promising us the latter rain. It says when the latter rain comes, then... There will be fruit. And then let's look at verse 21. So that, that your days may be multiplied. The refreshing of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the renewal of the Holy Spirit actually brings, you know, when you have rest in your mind, and you have peace in your heart, and there's no worry, there's no anxiety, there's this refreshing, there's this renewal, then you find that you're able to even live longer. 
uh, those who study uh, health, they will, they will tell you that, that sometimes the pressure, the depression, the worry, the anxiety, they cut short our lives. But when the refreshing of the Holy Spirit comes and he says, I give you this latter in so that you'll be able to have rest of mind and peace of mind and refreshing. And in that verse 21, it says that your days will be multiplied and the days of your children in the land that the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them the latter part of that verse 21. Look at that. Read it out loud. As. Okay, check it up and let's read. Won't you go? And that's, that's the consequence of the latter rain coming upon the people of God. That it says, you will leave the days of heaven on earth. And you think about that, you think about heaven, and think about the glory of God in heaven, the honor of God in heaven, you think about the provision in heaven, and the victory and the success in heaven. It says, when I give you the latter rain, it will be that the ultimate goal or the ultimate result of that will be, you will leave the days of heaven on earth. I pray it will be so. We're coming back to Joel chapter 2, the purpose of the latter in Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, verse 23 again, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down up for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Now, when that latter rain comes, what's the purpose? What's the result? What's the consequence? What else will God do? Verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. In a practical way, what that is saying is, look at this time now, this period now. And look back to five years ago or ten years ago, twenty years ago since you became a Christian. And then when you became a Christian, the picture God painted in your heart, the vision God revealed to you, the revelation he gave you, that this is what you do, this is what you'll do. Now for the past 15 years, you've been living a so-so Christian life. And all those years, 15 years, you're almost thinking, are they not wasted? And the things the Lord revealed to me 10 years ago, 15 years ago, why is it they are not done yet? The Lord is saying, all those years that appear wasted and lost, that if you will have the Holy Ghost upon your life and there's the outpouring and there's the latter rain coming upon you, he says all those years, it will restore everything. Everything we have lost spiritually. All the grants we should have gained. All the places we should have gone. And everything we should have accomplished for the kingdom of God. All those years the Lord will restore unto every one of us in Jesus name. Look at the church now as a church. That is deeper life here. And you're thinking... What if, uh, you know, we had revival at this particular time? You remember the year when it appeared as a great outpouring of the Spirit, a real breakthrough. And people were coming to the church and, you know, from this area, from that area, from this tribe and from that other nation. And then what happened that that kind of inflow into the church stopped? And then you say, if things had continued like it was five years ago, seven years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, we shouldn't be where we are now. That's what the Lord is saying. That's why he says we need the outpouring of the Spirit and the coming of the latter rain upon us. And he says when that happens, it's going to give us restoration. And then it says in verse, in verse 26, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Eat in plenty and be satisfied. Uh, have you ever thought about it? That it appears that the church that has the greatest doctrine has the least finance to carry out that doctrine.